Subway famous $5 footlongs. So many sublicious choices, like the delicioso spicy Italian. And when you enjoy any regular footlong, order one of the many Subway dollar footlong sidekicks, like 21 ounce drinks and tasty sides, just $1 each or less. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife. Cutting through a well-aged state. Now, now, now. Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. All right, NBA playoffs coming up this weekend. We have a special two-part podcast for you. In part one, we're going to talk about the West playoffs with ESPN.com's Mark Stein and eventually Rick Buecher is going to come on about ten minutes in on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. So here we go. What's happening, Steiny Mo? I'm back from suspension. You're back from suspension. We, we've we reviewed your resume af, at the three-month mark, and we decided we'd re-allow you. The most egregious NBA suspension since Diaw and Stoudemire? <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, you, you wouldn't give us a tidbit. The readers were upset. They, they wanted you to be punished. Yeah, look at the guy you're back in now who's not even here to join us. Probably That's true. Probably surfing. The only That's guy, true. Well, I mean, he's from Cincinnati. Who does he think he's kidding? He could be facing a year-long suspension if he doesn't come in soon. I, but since it's just you and me right now, I want to quickly talk about the Mavs because you're there the whole season. You're watching this stuff. I have been working on my MVP column for the last, oh, three weeks. It might, it might end up being 12,000 pages. Um, is Jason Terry the MVP of this team? I would have said so early in November. It's two straight years that my boy has started slow, obviously referring to Dirk and – Terry was definitely their best player early on. I, I think Dirk has quietly had a really good season, and, and nobody's talking about it. Uh, but there's no question, you know, I, you, you could make the case. I mean, him going to the bench, they had no bench. I mean, now they're actually getting something from guys like Berea and Singleton and Brandon Bass. But there were long stretches early in the year where he was a one-man bench. And... You know, as the Pistons found out, starters don't always want to go to the bench. So, I, I mean, I, I give the guy a lot of credit because, you know, he did that for the team. He's going to win the sixth man. And right. the guy is, I mean, he is a great shot maker, as we saw last night. I mean, the guy is just, if he's open, it's going in. Well, it seems like he's their clutch guy at the end of the games. I actually researched this. 82games.com has... They, they break down the clutch stats, which so basically any close game lasts five minutes. Dirk stats are terrible. 39% shooting in the clutch. Meanwhile, Terry is like above 50%. And it just seems over and over again when they go to him, he scores. Now I'm wondering in the playoffs, do we do we know officially who they're playing in or no? No, I mean, it's, it's looking like Denver. But, I mean, there are still about 74 permutations that could uh, could right. happen in the next couple of days. So they could still get to six. I, 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 think, I think Utah is going to be stuck in eighth now. But If uh, you're a Mavs fan, though. I, I feel better about Jason Terry with the ball in a tie game in the last 30 seconds than Dirk. I do. Well, people have, have leveled that criticism at Dirk over the years, but this year he has knocked in a couple buzzer beaters. So, you know, I, I kind of feel like it's going the other way. He, he had actually never made a buzzer beater, but I know I know 82games.com, it's not just buzzer beaters. I know, I mean, sure. What do they classify the clutch as? Like the last two minutes with a one-possession game or whatever the standards they use. No, I think you're confusing that with the super clutch stat. <laughs> <laughs> they have clutch and super and clutch. One weekend at MIT, and you're you're all about the numbers now. <laughs> <laughs> but now, I, I mean, I, I'm definitely more intrigued, but the uh, I, I, they have to come up with a way to measure the, ver- the Vergeals of the world. And when they do that, I'm on board. But until then, I think it's we're still in grain of salt territory. Yeah, I mean, I thought one of my rare good questions in my in my virgin stint as a moderator was, you know, why isn't there more defense? You know, why is it? Why can't we find a way to measure? Defense well, we have the answer. They, these, they 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 have all this stuff. They just don't share it with us. Yeah, that's probably true. Cuban, I think, is sitting on like the mother load. I think he has stats for everything that's happened since like the George Mikan era. And he's just not telling us. He's just hoarding it. <laughs> Unless it's ref stats, as Maury said. Let's talk about the, the West because, 
I cannot remember a weirder situation where obviously the Lakers are going to make the Western Finals barring a catastrophic upset. But that other spot is so up for grabs that at gunpoint, I don't even know who I'd go with. But, you know, I, I'm depressed. I mean, I guess you could say, hey, it's going to be great in the first two rounds because all these teams are so even. But if nobody can push the Lakers, you know, what are we doing this for? I mean, and, and right now, besides Portland, and I think people are really getting – I mean, we're so desperate for somebody who can push the Lakers that everybody's now pushing the idea that Portland can do it. And there's no question that they got a great home court advantage. They got a closer in Roy. They got all this length and athletes and depth. I mean, all true. But there's got to be some sort of playoff factor that when these guys are under the bright lights, I mean, none of them have been there. Portland is such a bandwagon pick and so illogical to me. They're tough at home. I'll give them that. And they do have the closer, but... Talk about a team that hasn't been there. Holy mackerel. And you know what I really don't like about, about that team? Because everybody says, oh, they got nothing to lose. Are you kidding me? They got the most, you know, just about the most rabid fans. Those right. fans have expectations now. They want to yes. win now. If things don't go well in a home game, you know, that you're going to feel it in that building. Because, I, I mean, I, I don't think that their fans at all are, are taking a we're just happy to be here attitude. No. And, and, in fact, as you said, it goes the other way. They live and die with this team, and they fully expect them to make the finals. The uh, They remind me of the Hornets of last year in that this will be their get the feet wet. If they win a series, I think that's really good. That's a nice little step for them. Nothing, I, winning two straight series, I'm not seeing it. I guess it would depend on the matchups, but... You know, I, I think I just think it's a whole other ball game when you get into the. Um, I really, I'm postseason. really going to be curious if they get San Antonio in the first round. That is going to be really, really interesting because even without Manu, you have to think that the Spurs are going to be able to control tempo and kind of give these guys a playoff clinic. Well, and also, who guards Tony Parker and the Blazers? That's a bad matchup. Yeah, you don't I mean, want Steve Blake guard and Tony Parker. I mean, I know, you know. I mean, I've talked to some people who actually made the outlandish claim, and they believe it, that they think the Spurs are in some ways better when Manu's not there because it just gives Parker more freedom to just go. But, I mean, with the, no state, with the state Duncan's in, I mean, you can't even – I don't see how you can support that claim. But I actually had – I had a smart person tell me that the other day. Well, is Duncan healthy, or is he just old? I can't tell. <sighs> well, it's – I mean, and actually I kind of wish – Buke was not surfing, was actually on this call because, you know, he, he just is, emailed. Uh, he said he's coming. He is, uh, you know, he is definitely a, a, a Duncan expert as much as anybody. But the crazy thing is Duncan looks so good early. Yeah. I mean, he was ripped up. Apparently the Spurs had him boxing, training and tossing tractor tires all summer. I mean, and just was just fantastic. And then it all just deteriorated. I got a theory. I have a theory. Shocker, you have a theory? I have a theory. I'm going to step on the MVP column. I hate to do it, but it's only one paragraph. And, again, it's 1,200 pages. Um, he hit the 1,000-game mark very quietly about uh, about three weeks before the numbers started dropping. The same thing happened to KG last year. KG hit 1,000 games. Like two weeks later, hurt his knee and has never really been the same. And I really think that 1,000-game mark – is the best barometer we have for right around when a guy is going to start to show decline. With Duncan, we've seen it the last two months. The stats have shown it. He looks slow. Just looks like he's getting old to me. Not a bad thing. It happens. He's had a great run. It's like year 13. Um, he's arguably the, been the most consistent superstar ever other than, I mean, even Oscar only did it for like nine years. Duncan's on year 13. But at some point, you know, you're not going to defeat Father time. I hate to use the cliche, but no, you know. I, I guess it's just again because the season started out so well, and and everybody was saying, you know what, Manu's out right now, Tony's out right now, but man, Tim looks good. Yeah, but you and, know what though, they had to put on those miles on him in November, December that normally they're not putting on him because really they needed to compete. They needed I, to make I, sure they got the eight seed. I guess, but also you know he had the summer off. I mean, you know he didn't. He's not playing on Team USA anymore. I don't know. It just seems like a pretty dramatic flip from that to where he's now wearing two knee braces and talking about it all the time. I mean, that's, mm. but you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably to the point after, you know, what is it? Like you said, 13 years, he needs to be the Robinson. Now he needs to go to David Robinson mode. And when the Spurs have all that free agent money in 2010, 
you know, they need to try to get the guy who's who's now going to be the Duncan so he can be David. Well, we saw it happen with Shaq in 2000, like right around 2003, 2004. And when they made the finals that last season, he couldn't do it every night, but he could he could pull it up some nights. And I remember there was he had a great game in the in the finals against Detroit. They lost. It was like game three or game four. He had like you know thirty nine points and twenty six rebounds, some crazy stat line. And Phil Jackson said afterwards, you know, we wasted a, you know a great throwback night from Shaq. And I feel like Duncan might be at that stage now. He's not gonna every night. He's not gonna put up his twenty four twelve that he does in the playoffs over the year. But he might have like two games per series in him. I don't know if the Spurs can carry the rest of the load for him. I do think there is a difference, though, because I think in KG's case, I think he's been really playing on a bad leg all year long, and your boys just kind of yeah. kept it quiet, and now it's out there for everybody to see. <sighs> that, I mean, they did an unbelievable job of keeping it quiet. They, for four weeks, they've been claiming he's you know two games away from coming back. Meanwhile... You know, I don't know if you've read between the lines, but they've never said what was actually wrong with the knee. It's not like, yeah, he's got a torn MCL, or yeah, he's spraining his MCL, or yeah, it's a hyperextended knee. They don't know what's wrong with it. He's just old. He's, his knees have 1,100 games on him, and they're wearing out. And I think that's what really scares the Celtics. They would never admit this. They claim everything's fine. But here's this guy whose three-year extension hasn't even kicked in yet. Right. And his knee now is to the point where... They don't totally know what's what's wrong with him or whether it will ever get better, and it probably won't. A little scary. I also think, you know, everybody's saying, well, if KG's back or when they get KG back or with a healthy KG, I think people have to really flip that around and, th- and just assume that he's not going to be healthy. Which raises, though, the age-old question, which uh, you can apply to the heat as well. Was uh, Was Al Jefferson worth one championship? If yeah, that's all, my, if that's all it is. My dad and I had this discussion the other day, ironically. Um, we both said, yes, the goal is to win a title. I mean, you could have said the same thing after the 2005 playoffs when Danny had the deal ready for Chris, you know, basically to get Chris Paul. It was going to be Pierce to Portland for the number three pick and Nick Van Exel's contract that they could have waived. Pierce caught wind of it and squashed it. But would you rather have – you know, what ended up happening with Pierce, or would you rather have the Chris Paul Al Jefferson Foundation? I'd rather have the title. But I you know just what? think I would it's going to be grim. I, and I think it's, you know, living here in Dallas and seeing how close these guys were and knowing that that might be the closest they ever get and how agonizing it is to get that close and not win. It's worth it for the Celtics and it's worth it for the Heat. No question. I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather have it. I'd rather have it Miami's way, where you rent Shaq, win your championship, and you find a way to glom them off on the Phoenix Suns, who end up paying some salary without even making the playoffs. Rick That's Buecher, everybody. Tonight. Yeah, who is that? Who is that uh, intruder? Hey, Buecher. Can I just... believe? Can I believe you guys started without me? It's unbelievable. Simmons, well, Simmons does the classic. We're waiting for you when I text him after, <laughs> like, like, without giving me a number, giving me any, any indication as to exactly how I was supposed to partake. That's not true, but it's, I'm going to let it slide. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like, uh, inviting one of your buddies out to the club and you go, where, where the, he- where the heck were you, man? And, and you end up changing where you went without <laughs> telling him. All and right, then, I apologize. And then you give him flack for not joining you. Now, where well, were you though? Tell us where you were though. He's doing Sports Center. Uh, right. I had to do – no, I, by 11.15, I was done. I requested the later start. Unless you guys have already been going since 10.45 and you're no. already – this is already a record recording. Listen, we only went for eight minutes, and here's what you missed. We tried to figure out whether Tim Duncan is old or he's hurt. So you decided for us. Really? I thought you were talking about KG's knees. I, well, we, they, I gave we, you they, a rare compliment, and I said that you're the Tim, Dunk, Tim Duncan expert of the three of us, so you, you tell us. No, he's, he's old. He's old. Yeah. He's got he's got uh, tendinosis, which is a slightly more severe uh, form of tendonitis. And tendonitis isn't he hasn't had any sort of uh, cataclysmic injury. This is just the wear and tear. It's a lot of uh, it's, it's the same as what what uh, Simo was saying about uh, KG. You know, there's right. just there's a lot of minutes on these guys' bodies. And and keep in mind, we're talking about. 
uh, guys who may have done a great job of keeping themselves in shape, but they're big guys. Yep. And big guys just aren't built, aren't built for long seasons and the grind of going up and down. It's, it's hard enough for the Kobe's and the Michaels and the Scotty Pippins to do that. But then when you're talking about guys that are, that are carrying 240, 250, uh, and upward, uh, it's just, a, it's a whole other physical dynamic. Yeah, I was saying to Steiny Mo that I, I think a thousand games, regular season plus playoffs, right around there is when you're going to start to see some erosion. It's just a lot yeah, of miles I'd, you got. I'd say it's, I'd say it's minutes, uh, as, as much as games. And, and the, the difficulty is, uh, analytically figuring out how much do playoff minutes and uh, playing from October to June and then yeah. playing from October to, to May or June again, I, I believe that that actually increases the weight of those minutes. But right. you know, 40,000 overall, when they hit that, you just, you, the 40,000 minutes just seems to be, if you play off and regular season combined, guys, there's, they don't have that limitless energy that they, they they once might have had. I mean, KG's played two more years, but you would argue Duncan has more mileage. Yeah, he's got. Well, I was, I'm looking at absolutely because he's gone deeper, right. more often. Uh, and I just I think there's I think there's an impact when you have a short off season, and your body never quite gets a chance to recover. Duncan said he played – well, this 03 season was incredible. 81 regular season games and then 24 playoff games for a total of almost 4,500 minutes, 4,400 minutes. And then in 2005, 23 playoff games. In 2007, 80 games plus 20 playoff games, so that was another 100. Those 100-game yeah. seasons are killers. I mean, you just – it's almost like a season and a half when you throw without, in playoff minutes. Without question. Well, do you think are, are the Spurs? Would you want to play them in round one, or are you still afraid of them? Round one, looking at the teams that they are going to be playing against, I give them a chance. But uh, but I'm not afraid of them. They're they're just it's too easy to focus your attention. It, here's the thing: we've always said that you have to that that the that the Spurs are not going to beat themselves. You know, that you're going to have to beat them. Well, with the teams that I see, all they have to do is not choke. If they yeah. just play, they're going to beat the San Antonio Spurs. The Spurs just, they just don't have enough to go to. Right, but two of the three teams they could end up against. Two of, look What's at two of the three teams they end up against. I mean, Portland and Houston. I mean, both, both Portland and Houston have, have more than enough talent simply by their depth. To uh, to take San Antonio, and out. they also have choke potential with the Blazers having no experience, and the Rockets. I just have to believe if things start going south, the fact they've never won a series is going to creep into their mind. Uh, you know what? I, I I'll, I'll give you that, but I'm not because of the way Portland has executed during the regular season. Uh, you, you talk to people, uh, talk to scouts around the league, and they'll tell you. This is one of the most efficient teams and most effective teams in what they do. Their, uh, their percentage in, of success in plays coming out of timeouts is at the top of the league. And those are the kind of things that when you get to the playoffs, those loom large. So I, I'm usually a big believer in exactly what you're saying, Steiny Mo, that if you haven't been there, it's just a different dynamic. And I would say that the one element – that is different is is that you've got to be focused every single possession and and guys just get mentally tired because they're not used to that that kind of precision. I just think San Antonio is so uh, so vulnerable that talent wise that you can make mistakes and you're going to have a chance to recover against them because they're just they're going to have they're going to have a really hard time scoring. I see it totally different. I feel like that's a brutal baptism for the Blazers. I just think, A, the Spurs will control tempo, and the Blazers don't even run that much. Yeah. So I think they have a great advantage. And also, early in the playoffs, you're going to get the Spurs' best game. Their, their issues are going to be, the longer it goes without Manu, they don't have enough. They don't have enough. I mean, I would and agree. also, can they score enough to beat Portland? I mean, I guess that's the question, but... 
I think Portland or Houston, that is a tough first round. Well, I, look, I'm, I'm not saying that San Antonio is out. It wouldn't be surprised. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if if they went to the second round. I don't see them getting beyond that. But whereas before, I would say San Antonio versus a team like Portland with no experience or Houston with their track record of getting out of the first round, I would say this is a San Antonio series. There's no way they lose. I just, I, the door is open for them to get knocked out in the first round. The other thing with Portland is that they do lock teams down defensively a little bit. They're, yes, they, they do. They're only giving up like 94 a game, and they, and they control the pace to some degree, which is something – that's why I'm a little dubious at Denver. You know, as I know it's oh, nice, that, the number yeah. two seed, but you're giving no. up 100 points a game. In the playoffs, things are going to slow down. I just here's see them the other, jacking up bad here, shots. Here's the other thing with Denver is that and, – and watching them against the Lakers uh, in that game the other night, they still play in these big ebbs and flows of uh, – they don't, they don't play consistently. They play yeah. hard for a couple of minutes. Then they let it go for a couple of minutes. Then they play hard for a couple of minutes. And they, those kind of teams are hugely vulnerable. I just don't know that they have the mental tenacity to play focused basketball from possession to possession. And well, they also have kill them. That's going to kill them in the end. They also have a little bit of an alpha dog thing because you know I, th- I just think Carmelo is a much better option in the last two minutes. But Billups is still in that Mr. Big Shot mode. I don't yeah. think he's that yep. type of player anymore, and I think he takes bad shots. If I if I'm a Denver fan, I want to go to Carmelo every single time down the stretch. The other thing that worries me, I don't for, I don't get the same sense from him that I get from Wade and LeBron. Like, hey guys, this is my team. Get me the ball. He's a little bit passive at this point in his career. I, I just feel like he should be a little bit further along in that department. So I see that. I think they're an upset. They're player. also too damn small. I mean, that. I mean, let's not forget that either. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, well, you, and, and you still have the Chris Anderson factor of Ke- uh, Chris or or uh, or Kenyon just doing something absolutely nutty that completely th- or J R Smith that throws your team completely overboard in the middle of a series. And that's, well, that, it's just that's right, why it's just right to happen. That's why I. That's why you know I love the season Chauncey's had, and I'm not gonna get all into the stats. I mean. There is such a knucklehead factor on that team, and all the friction with George and Carmelo and George and Jr. I just yep. think the job he has keeping that crew sane. I mean, there's just no stat you can put on that. It's a good point. I agree. Good I agree. Point. He was on my MVP ballot. Would you agree that Denver, out of the out of any of the potential top four seeds, the biggest and most logical candidate to be upset in round one? Correct. Who are we saying the four seeds are now? I mean, right now it's L.A., Denver, Houston, Portland. You could see San Antonio maybe switch spots. And I'd see, we have three teams tied at 53-28 right now. We're recording this on a Tuesday. So, I mean, out of that top five, it seems like Denver is the most vulnerable to me. I just don't know if they're playoff ready. I just don't like that matchup for the Mavs. Though. I mean, they've swept the Mavs this year, and for all the – Wart, you guys just listed, they still have a lot of athleticism, and the Mavs don't deal with that well. I mean, Chauncey, you know, that's, that's a good matchup for Kid. That's not a yes. problem, but they've, they've got a ton of athleticism and no answer for Mello. I mean, Mello goes wherever he wants to go on the floor against them. So Yeah, there's a little rock, paper, scissors with the West because, you know, I, I think like New Orleans, I think they could beat Houston. But if I'm New Orleans, I'm not sure – you know, I'd want to play, say, Portland. I don't know. It's a, I'd have to look at it. But it seems like every team has, like, two teams they probably might have a good chance against and then two they yeah. might not want to play. Yeah, you know? a, lot of it, a lot of it certainly is matchups. But so much of it is, too, just the health of these teams. Yeah. So Utah, Utah is, is not right. Uh, uh, is that Dallas, health? Is that, is, uh, hold on. With Utah, is that health or is that chemistry? I think it's mental health. Yeah, I do well, too. Well, it's a combination. But Carlo, uh, Boozer is clearly not right. He, he's he, he's not right, and and Kirilenko is mentally not right. Yeah. And they they've been a flawed team from the start, just defensively. Everybody still thinks of them as the Utah Jazz, and then they're they're not that. They're they're closer to being the Phoenix Suns than than being the Utah Jazz. They're not. They're they're a bad defensive team. And they have been, that's because they have bad defensive players, and that's not going to change. But why did they hang in there all year long, 
didn't have their start. They didn't have. They never had their starting lineup for like 50 games. They get all the way to the end and then they implode. I mean, it just makes no sense. It doesn't. Have, I'm, not, I'm not sold. They like their coach. I mean, it's not sold. What? I, I know Jerry Sloan, one of the great coaches ever, and all that. But it seems like there's something. There's a dynamic that's a little weird with them. And but again, why wouldn't that have cropped up earlier? I mean, there have been people who complained about playing for Sloan for years. I mean, it's not like this is a new thing. It's like they hung in there for, you know, 60, 70 games, and now it's just it's is when it's all fallen apart. I mean, you know. Well, I think this I'm, year you have the Boozer Millsap thing. I think that's been a weird situation the whole year. I'm not sure they're not better off with Millsap just playing, and then Carolina well, goes a basket I, I case. They they survived early because because Paul because Millsap came out and was a house on fire, but he, he broke down physically. And yeah. that's where I think you're in, in real danger to say we can let Boozer go and, and we can we can ride Millsap because I'm not sure that physically he's capable. He's he's a Ben Wallace type guy in that he has to play with a lot of energy to be an effective player. And if he's not right a hundred percent, his efficiency goes way, way down. So uh, I, I believe that's where, you know, basically they're playing without a, a power forward right now. And with Kirilenko having lost his mind, now you're playing with two out of three of your, what should be your starting front line. And with Momento Kerr being a three point shooter, that's enough to, that's enough to take you from being a, a threat in the Western Conference to being a team that's just scraping into the playoffs. Well, the, rumble, the rumblings that I have heard, which I have not written yet for the record. Yes. Uh, is, oh, you, you know, give us a little scoop on the podcast. That, that, Woohoo! And I'm sure Buke will back me up on this. The, uh, I mean, all your, you, they came into the season with all these free agents and everybody was worried about what that effect is going to be. And now it really does seem that, the uncertainty of, you know, what's going to happen with Boozer, Millsap, Okur, that that stuff has really seeped into the locker room there. And just on the road, these guys, something goes bad, and there's just they're, they're, they give in. I mean, they've done yep. it time and time and time again. Well, you know, the other yep. interesting thing, I, on top of that, this is a particularly weird season because this summer nobody knows who's getting money, who's going to have money. It's not like, you know, like if, the, if Millsap season happened four years ago, he would have said, oh, I'm guaranteed $55, $60 million this year. Somebody's going to overpay me. This summer, right. nobody's getting overpaid. I don't even think Boozer could get – I mean, what's it, could he get $8 million a year this summer? Boozer's I don't see a, it. Boozer, Boozer's going to have to think twice about opting out. I don't think he should. Uh, I yeah. don't know that he's – I mean, unless he's, he's got somebody already locked up, which I don't, uh, I don't know that he does. Yeah, he might be better off having another year and and getting healthy rather than going out and and testing the waters right now. Because you, if you look at 2010, uh, it's going to be a little bit like the Baron Davis Corey Maggette thing. Yeah. somebody's going to lose somebody or not get the guy that they saved all that money for, and they're going to have to make a face saving move. That's a, that's where I could see Boozer ending up picking up a contract. Whereas right now, I, I just I don't I don't see anybody investing uh, a cornerstone price uh, in him at this stage. But yeah, the but wild card I'd... is Detroit, though. What I mean, they cannot go – obviously, AI is not coming back, but they cannot go through another season like this. And if they don't make a move, they're going to basically be 500 again. I mean, do they really want to live like this for another year? Hey, but Joe Dumars has the Midas touch. Come on. <laughs> I sense a certain amount of sarcasm. Like, Come on, that guy's money, man. That Iverson trade. Uh, you know what they're going to do? They're going to they're going to try to convince Toronto to trade Bosch. That's what they're going to do. Yeah, congratulations. Good luck. I don't. You know what? I don't know that it's going to take a whole lot of convincing. I think Toronto knows that the writing is on the wall. The big question you have, and that is, will be the sweepstakes this summer because everybody's going to be trying to trade for him. Yeah. The big question you have is: Is Chris Bosch? Is he a cornerstone player? I, I was just going to say if. If I can overpay to get a guy who just led his team to 32 wins, I got to do it. I mean, give me a break. The guy, I mean, the guy is a second you gotta, banana. You got to ask that question. Look, any of the other guys we're talking about, Dwayne Wade, uh, LeBron James, Chris Paul, any, any, any of these guys, do you look at them and say that they would not have done better with that Toronto team than, when, than what Bosch did? I think Bosch makes the most sense on Houston. I, you know, with with a supporting framework of like he'll have Yao next to him and 
our test, and you know they had the pieces for a four for one, something like that. You you put are him you, on are, the is train. Is this another scoop alert? No, Mr. I, Mr. Maury's mouthpiece. Are you giving us something? No, the, I scoop, am not. the scoop is that he's actually saying Yao is a franchise-worthy guy for Boss to be next. No, I don't think he is either. But I think if you get a couple of those guys, maybe you emulate what happened with the 2004 Pistons, where you have a lot of really good players playing together. I don't think if Bosch goes to Detroit, where, where ultimately where does that take them? Does that get them the 47 wins? Like I, I don't see them in the title hunt with Chris Bosch. It's uh, you know the, the thing that we're overlooking here is it's all about price point. And it yeah. sounds good from a basketball standpoint to add add Bosch to Houston's team. I just don't know from a from a financial standpoint. I mean they're they're a tax paying team right now. Does that yeah. mean that you're letting Artest go? Are, I, you, I, are you keeping him and adding Bosch? You're letting Artest go. Look, look, it probably makes no sense to even try to figure out what's going to happen this summer because. I mean, I'm just hearing, starting to get word back from, like, the season ticket renewals of the various teams. Yeah. And it's a disaster. I mean, you're talking about some teams aren't even, you know, are barely at 50% renewals right now. And this is April when they're supposed to, the money start to, starts coming in, basically. You so, know where it's not a disaster? Where? Golden State. And I've, and, I've Rabid my, and, I've, and, and I've switched my opinion of those fans because – they are the ultimate. I've always talked about their passion, their intelligence. I'm done with that. They are such gluttons for punishment, man. I was at the game last <laughs> night. They are getting they are getting beat by 30 by San Antonio, and Anthony Randolph blocks a shot and goes to the other end and finishes with a dunk. And you would have thought that they had just qualified for the playoffs. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They they are the reason that this team. I'm not putting it on Chris Cohan. I'm not putting it on 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 Don Nelson. I'm putting the fans are the reason that this team stinks because they accept it being stinky. I would They're say the, I put the clips pay to watch that to, to watch a team going nowhere with a exciting losing brand of basketball. The clips are in that mix too. Same thing. Except they don't even play an exciting brand. No, they they play a stinky no, no, but even game. Warriors are giving you you know a Hollywood atmosphere, and and you're going to see the other team. The Warrior fans are going to see the Warriors. Hey, let's that is very true. Let's finish the West really quick. I asked Donnie Mo at gunpoint who he'd pick for that second spot in the Western Finals, and you never gave an answer. So let's hear it. At gunpoint, you have to make a pick. <laughs> you know what? I'd still probably go Spurs. Wow, really? Wow. Oh, man, I don't see that at all. There is no second place. You're asking for something that doesn't exist. There is no second place. The Lakers are in the finals. I mean, barring some catastrophic... That wasn't the question. What, the question. what is the question? Who is the second best team in the West? No, the question is who will play them in the Western finals? Who is oh, going to win two series in a oh, row? Oh, no, no. Okay, then no. I, I don't think the Spurs can win two rounds in the state they're in. Oh, okay. Um so I misunderstood your question. But I do think the Spurs are going to win a first-round series against any of those teams. I just think uh, – now, New Orleans could be tough if they're healthy because you know, they had enough trouble with their athleticism when everybody was right. – when they had everybody. Um, Buke? Portland Trailblazers. Really? I can't, I yeah. can't go there. Oh, I can't see that. That defies everything that would make sense about the NBA. I know. I know. But to me, to me it is it – is, it is a reflection of where, look, are they the healthiest team? Without question. They don't have, I mean, Odin has been there, hasn't been there all year, so I don't know that I really uh, count him. Do they have anybody else, they have anybody else in their first eight that is ailing? Not a one. Well, the other, the other thing with them is I think they have the best home, home court advantage in the West. And absolutely. And they're going to have, and they're, and they're going to have home court advantage. And I just, I, it's not so much that I believe in Portland or that I discount the, the value of experience. It's more that I look around and everybody else is so grievously flawed. They're just not 100%. I, I, you know, New, Orleans, I would, New Orleans would be my next choice, but uh, you know, watching them score 66 against the Rockets, yeah. at this stage, you, uh, that, look, no matter what Portland is, that's not happening. They're I'd not pick, doing that. I'd pick New Orleans 
if Chandler is healthy. But I think and Chandler and Peja will not be right, whether they play or not. They will yeah. not be right in the playoffs. You exactly. can mark that down exactly. right now. Man. They have no bench, so how is that possible? Buke, maybe. You exactly. might be right, Buke. I, I can't believe this. You're talking me into this. Because hey. you figure they're going to be really, really tough at home. They do have a closer. They're healthy. They... uh I think they'd be America's favorite, you know, a little bit similar to the 2007 Warriors. Who's not jumping right. on the, bla- on again, the Blazers? Me, can I just again? throw it in you know caution here? That home court advantage might not be such an advantage if in one of those first two games they find themselves in a, in a tough game. They mm. better get a 2-0 lead because the pressure there to win is bigger yeah. than anywhere. Uh, I'll give you that. I will say this, though, too, because we talk about them being so young and so inexperienced. Uh, you know, Brandon Roy sort of defies that. Rudy Fernandez defies that. They, they've got uh, Joel Prisbilla defies that. They have guys that may be young, but they're not young acting. The Denver Nuggets are a more young acting team for all of their experience and all their playoff experience than the core players for the Blazers. Hey, so, you know, I, I, I mean, it's a little amazing to me to hear this. And by the way, this is also my opportunity for all those people who've been uh, looking at the Blazers bl- uh, blowing out the the uh, the Thunder in, in the last two games and saying that my belief that the Thunder have a a brighter future than the Blazers that that's any indication of anything. I wasn't talking about right now, you knuckleheads. I'm talking about because of the 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 salary cap structure, because of the decisions that Portland's going to have to make on who to keep. And and just everything that I like about Oklahoma City, three, four years down the road, I think Thunder can overtake the Portland Trailblazers. Thank hey, you. Bu- I will get off my soapbox now. Hey, Buke, when when uh, Sam Presti was paying you for the lap dances, did he get three songs or five? <laughs> if you know if you know Sam Presti, you know that that is not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, this Portland Spurs series in round one, yeah. remi- it reminds me, of a series that is very close and dear to Steiny Mosart. Dallas Utah. Two thousand one. Dallas Utah. There you go. Five game series, game five, Dallas goes into Utah and yep. wins by one point. Probably still yep. the most incredible thing I've seen with my own eyes. Um but very nobody, similar that nobody U- won in Utah in those days. But the Utah the Utah know, team I, I was I banged got- up. I gotta say, being there for the birth of my child might be the most amazing. My my daughter might be the most wow. amazing. Now you're amazing wow, thing. you're I'm attacking sure. my fatherhood now. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm just I saying. Think we were, I'm I just think saying, we were talking about NBA. Goes to that, that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen, and it has to do in with covering the NBA. That they did not participate in. Wow. I. <clears throat> I, I didn't think I, it would take I wouldn't didn't think it would take this long for Buke's first totally condescending comment. Yeah. The uh <laughs> but two thousand one Utah and two thousand nine San Antonio, I think similar in a lot of ways. Little old, past its prime, forward who's kinda on the downside of his superstardom. And uh yep. yeah, I maybe still would, I still would say that a Mavs team with Nowitzki, Finley and Nash was better equipped to do that in a five game series, let's not forget. Good point. Then I, I, I'm not trying to knock Portland. What they have done is absolutely amazing. They've made me, basically, on Saturday when I did my weekend dime, I went with Van Gundy as coach. The Magic lost Friday night. They've blown the number two seed. Portland now with a chance to go as high as three. It may, basically made me take back my coach of the year belt and say, I can't do this till the season is over, till I see where everybody lands. Because if Portland finishes three, I mean, that might even be more amazing than Denver finishing two. So I'm... I'm, you know, rethinking everything on that score, but I just think it's going to be a different game in the playoffs. I think these these guys are, are you know, early in the season. I haven't been around the Blazers a lot this season, but early in the season when I got a chance to talk to them, I did kind of get a feeling like, hey, we just want to get there. Now, maybe that's changed in the last month because they put up all these good wins, but I, I just think they, they got a big education to overcome if they're going to beat San Antonio in the first, if that's what it is. If it's the Spurs, they got a big problem. Here's, here's what they have in their favor. If you remove the youth thing and the haven't been there thing, all that stuff. So great home court, very good defensively. Very, wouldn't you say one of the top five coaches? And then a closer at the end of the game. So they have they have the four components that you need in the playoffs to win. Not, not only that, anything. but as playing San Antonio in particular, they have uh, maybe the most athletic power forward in the game. Yeah. And 
that matchup is going to be a nightmare for San Antonio. All right, that wraps up part one of the three-man weave with Bucher and Stein. Click for part two, the East, and we talk about uh, beat reporting and some other good stuff. Until then. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.